Thanks, Chad. Can you hear me okay and see the slides? Looks great, yep. Excellent, great. Um, you might have watched my virtual talk online already. If you have, much of what I'm going to say today will be familiar. If you haven't watched the virtual talk and you find that you want more details and more mathematics after seeing this presentation, you can go online and check it out. There's more detail about the four, first 75% of today's presentation, but the remainder of the presentation is the same. Today I'll be telling you about everything other than radio velocities that we do when trying to understand planets that we might have observed with radio velocity observations. I'm really excited to be talking with all of you because the Sagan Summer Workshop is one of my favorite conferences and I'm so glad that they were able to seamlessly, at least seamlessly from my perspective, transition to a virtual meeting despite the chaos that we're dealing with right now. In this presentation, I'm going to address a series of questions. We'll start off by reviewing what transiting planets are, how they're detected, and how we can determine the properties of those planets. Next, we'll discuss the follow-up data that we can obtain to learn more about these systems and figure out which ones are real planets versus which ones are astrophysical false positives. We'll then move on to discuss how we determine the compositions of planets and what we've learned so far about how planet composition in terms of whether it's more rocky or more gas rich varies as a function of planet size and distance from the star. We'll then move on to talk about the three-dimensional orientations of planetary systems. That's a lot of text in the previous slide, so I also wanted to show you the streamlined outline. So we'll be doing transiting planets, follow-up observations, compositions, and system orientations. To begin, Transiting planets are those that cross in front of their host star and appear to block some of the light from the star. In much of this workshop, you've talked about radio velocity observations, which allow you to measure the mass of the planet by looking at how the planet is tugging the star, causing the light from the star to be Doppler shifted. Here on the right, you might be able to see this movie, and if you can't see it, you could download the virtual slides and watch it on your own computer. What this movie is showing is the transit of Venus, which happened now about five, 10 years ago, and what you see is that there's a dark disk crossing the surface of the sun. In this case, both Venus and the sun are close to us, so we can actually see the disk of the planet and the disk of the sun. We can also see star spots, which of course can complicate both transit observations and radio velocity observations. Here, Venus is relatively small compared to the sun, so it causes a tiny decrease in brightness if we were to add up all of the light from the sun. When we look from plan at planets that are orbiting stars farther away, they're too far away for us to actually see the disk of the star, but we can monitor how bright the star appears to be and infer the presence of a planet because the star is periodically getting dimmer by a set amount. Here's a movie from Planet Quest showing exactly how that happens. So we're looking at a system face on, but we wouldn't see a transit in this orientation because the star is not blocking the planet. Now, if we flip the system, the planet will cross in front of the star, allowing us to see the planetary transit. In the lower left of the screen, you see a plot showing the brightness of the system versus time. When the planet is in front of the star, we see a decrease in brightness, and this would happen once every planet orbital period. If we observe a star that does this, we can tell how big the planet is relative to the star, and we can also determine how long it takes the planet to go around the star. If we see multiple transits, we can just measure the time between consecutive transits. But if we only see one transit, it's more difficult to figure out what the planet's orbital period is because we don't know when the next transit will occur. We can make an educated guess by measuring how long it takes the planet to cross in front of the star and then assuming things about the planet's eccentricity to try to figure out what the orbital period might be. But we don't know whether the planet crosses across the center of the star, which would be the longest path, or just up near the top of the star, so there's some degeneracy there. Zooming in on the light curve, here's a figure from a wonderful article by Josh Wynn, written in 2010, that shows you the geometry of a transiting planet system. In the online talk, I've broken this down and highlighted various components of this figure and connected them with the equations you would use to determine the properties of a transiting planet. What I want you to get out from this live talk is just that we can measure or approximate how big the planet is relative to the star by measuring the transit depth delta, and we can also try to estimate how far the planet is from the center of the star by looking at how long it takes the planet to cross the distance of the star and what the shape is for these edges here. This period on the left where the planet is first crossing the disk of the star is known as egress, and the period on the right where the planet is exiting the disk of the star is known as egress. The time of the transit overall, um, we can measure here on the bottom 
Um, people vary in terms of whether they measure when the star first starts to get dimmer or just the period where the star is the dimmest. So be sure to check and see which, which formula and which rules people are using when they're quoting transit durations. But if you can measure the transit duration and the decrease in brightness delta, you're off to a good start at figuring what the properties of this system might be. For more details, go ahead and check out the virtual talk that's pre-recorded. We're now going to zoom ahead to space-based surveys for transiting planets. I'm sure almost all of you have heard of the NASA Kepler mission. This launched when I was in college, so for many of you, it might have been the spark that made you decide to study exoplanets in the future. Kepler was operating from 2009 to 2013, and in that time, it discovered thousands of planets and possible planets. Here you can see that Kepler discovered over 1,700 candidate planets, meaning objects that are pretty likely to be planets but haven't been quite fully verified as planets, and over 2,200 planets that have been validated. We'll talk more about what validation means in a couple slides. If you've grown up in an era where exoplanets have always existed and have always been commonplace, you might see these numbers, but they might not be earth-shattering in the way that they would be to someone who was born in a time when we only had eight planets, as Jane showed in her animation. To show again just the impact that the Kepler mission had on the field, let's take a look at the population of planets that were known before the launch of the Kepler mission. Here I'm showing you the size of the planet relative to Earth on the left side versus the orbital period in days on the bottom. You can see horizontal lines marking planets that are the size of Earth, Neptune, and Jupiter. The different colors indicate different methods for detecting these planets. The pink planets were found using the transit method, and you can see that because of the geometric bias of the transit method and the need to watch the planet cross in front of the star, these objects tend to be very close to their stars. So we have planets here that have orbital periods of 10 days or less, that's really, really short orbital periods, and they're all basically the size of Jupiter, or a little bit larger. Some of them are about twice the size of Jupiter, indicating that they might have been puffed up by all of the light from the star. We also have many blue dots. These are the radio velocity planets that you probably heard about earlier this week in the workshop. You can see that as you go to longer periods, these planets seem to be getting more and more massive, which reflects the fact that it's harder to find lower mass planets. You get a bigger signal with a more massive planet. And here we're going out to orbital periods of over a thousand days, but we also have a lot of objects with shorter orbital periods. For context, in our solar system, the shortest period planet is Mercury, and that has an orbital period of about 90 days. So down here in the left side of this diagram, these are planets that are unlike anything in our solar system. And then we have a couple dots from pulsar timing and microlensing. So this was the landscape before the launch of Kepler. After Kepler, it looked like this. Just in case you missed it, before, after, before, after. Kepler found all of these tiny yellow dots showing that planets that are small are actually really common. And with Kepler, we were able to see that even though we had found Jupiter-sized planets before, those planets are not the dominant type of planet in the Milky Way galaxy. They're just the easiest planets to find. So Kepler was a game changer because, because it allowed us to access this population of much smaller planets. As you look at this diagram, it might appear to be that there's a line here where you have lots of planets to the left and no planets to the right. What you're seeing here is another selection effect. It's harder and harder to find planets as they get smaller because the transit depth is smaller, and it's harder to find them as they get to longer orbital periods because the geometric likelihood of transit is lower and the time between transits is larger. So if you had a planet with an orbital period of 1,000 days and you only had 200 days of data, odds are you wouldn't see that planet transit even if it was perfectly aligned across in front of the star from your viewing perspective. So as you look at this diagram, it's important to remember that this lower left region is a region where planets are actually believed to be quite common, they're just hard to find. All of these yellow dots found by Kepler were found in a single patch of the sky in this field here. If it's clear tonight where you are, you can go outside, and if you're in the northern hemisphere, you can go outside and look at the Kepler field near the constellation of Cygnus. And think about the fact that there are thousands of planets orbiting stars in that teeny patch of the sky. If you really want to find planets in your own sky and you happen to be in the southern hemisphere, you could instead look for results from the NASA's TESS mission, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. TESS launched in April 2018, 
to conduct an all-sky survey for transiting planets orbiting bright nearby stars. Having spent the week thinking about radio velocity, you know why bright stars are important. It's because we'd like to measure the masses of these objects, and most of the stars observed by Kepler are just too faint to enable precise radio velocity observations. We also know that with James Webb, we'll be able to look at much more of the sky than just that tiny little patch near the constellation of Cygnus. So it would be nice to have planets that are all over the sky to allow astronomers to study the atmospheres of planets in different situations. For instance, planets in clusters that are very young or planets orbiting low metallicity stars or high metallicity stars, low mass stars, high mass stars. With tests, we're getting planets orbiting a broad array of stars in a wide variety of configurations, which will allow us to do more interesting studies of the composition of planetary atmospheres and interiors and how that varies with stellar properties. To drive the point home that Tess is looking at a wider range of the sky than Kepler, here's a figure from Zach Berta Thompson showing the search space examined by Kepler and Tess. Here we're at the center of this blue ball and Tess looks out into this teal area here. You can see that the Tess search space is relatively close to the Earth, which means that your typical Tess target star will be brighter just because it's closer. With Kepler, we looked out much, much farther into the galaxy, which means that many of the targets are fainter. Kepler was designed as a statistical mission, so it was important to have a broad sample of stars and to get high precision data of those stars. Kepler did a great job telling us about the frequency of planets orbiting different types of stars and set the groundwork that we need in order to interpret the observations from tests. With tests, we're switching gears and finding specific planets that are great for further study. TESS is allowing us to look at the interiors of planets, to determine atmospheric compositions, and then also to continue the demographics work that was begun using data from Kepler, radio velocity surveys, and ground-based transit surveys and microlensing surveys, and the work that is now being done with direct imaging surveys. There's an important caveat, though, which is that when something like Kepler or TESS sees evidence of a transiting planet, and by that I mean sees a decrease in brightness of a star that occurs at periodic intervals, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a transiting planet. In some cases, you would have a decrease in brightness because a planet is crossing in front of the star. In other cases, though, you could have two stars that cross in front of each other, or maybe a system where you have an eclipsing binary that's close to another star on the detector and then blends the light of the binary, causing you to see a tiny decrease in brightness that's actually caused by one star blocking part of another star's surface. In this case, these three configurations on the right here would not actually be evidence of transiting planets, but they might look like transiting planets when figuring out the brightness of a star versus time. It's important to be able to distinguish these real transiting planets in the upper left from astrophysical false positives like these. During the Kepler era, tools like Blender and Vespa, which was developed by Tim Morton, were made to try to figure out which objects were most convincing based on Kepler data alone. It would be nice to go out and get radio velocity observations to measure the masses of all of these planets and figure out which ones are real and which ones are not, but that was prohibitive during the Kepler era because there were simply too many planets and too many faint stars. You know that measuring radio velocities of small planets is really tricky, so if we don't have the time or the ability to measure radio velocities with a precision of 10 centimeters a second for hundreds of planets, then we need to have another shortcut to allow us which system, to allow us to determine which systems we should concentrate on. In the TESS era, it's a little bit easier because these stars are brighter, so radio velocities are typically cheaper than they would be in the Kepler era, but we still have the problem of having thousands of possible systems to look at. TESS has already found over 2,000 candidates. In my research group, graduate student Stephen Jacqueline has built a tool that's specifically designed to do this for tests. It's called Triceratops, and you can read more about it at this link on the archive here. The updated version of the paper is getting ready to go out, and it's expanding Triceratops from a vetting tool to a validation tool, and folding in all of the wonderful work from the test follow-up observing program. So let's talk about what is, what is entailed in follow-up observing programs. TESS is set up to try to validate and measure the masses of at least 50 planets smaller than Neptune. The point of this goal is to try to figure out how planet composition changes as you go to a smaller and smaller planet and, and try to figure out which of those planets might potentially be like Earth. In order to figure out which of the TESS objects of interest or possible planets are real planets, the TESS team has developed the TESS follow-up observing program, which is divided into subgroups that each do part of the analysis required to figure out which planets are real. The first of those groups is seeing limited imaging. 
One of the things I love about this group is that it includes many amateur astronomers and many undergraduate institutions that have telescopes that might be seen as too small to do astrophysics. That's not true at all. You can do great astrophysics with a backyard telescope and subgroup one really makes that clear. What they do is they, they observe a field of the sky that includes the test target star and nearby stars. They then monitor the brightness of those stars over time and see which of the objects looks dimmer. By producing a higher resolution map of the scene than the map from TESS, which has pixels of 20 by 20 arc seconds, which is huge, they're able to figure out whether the candidate host star actually gets dimmer. And if it doesn't, they can identify nearby eclipsing binaries that might actually be the source of the transit-like event. Subgroup one, for some cases, can also figure out better transit times, which allows us to better estimate when we want to look at the system with, say, James Webb or the Hubble Space Telescope to observe a transit, and also measure the variations in the transit times, which is a way of measuring the masses of the planets without getting radio velocities. Subgroup two does reconnaissance spectroscopy. You've heard from Annalise that you can measure the metallicity of a star from its spectrum. So with subgroup two, what we do is we take a spectrum of a star and we use that spectrum to figure out the temperature, surface gravity, and metallicity of the star. This is important because we only know the properties of our planet as well as we know the properties of the host star because we measure the planet size relative to the size of the host star. If we're looking for planets that might be habitable, we also want to know what the temperature of the star is so that we can use the Stefan Boltzmann law to estimate the equilibrium temperature of the planet. With subgroup two, we can also identify spectroscopic binaries, which can also masquerade as transiting planets. And we can figure out how quickly the star is rotating, which allows us to figure out which stars might be the best targets for high precision radio velocity observations. In subgroup three, we take higher resolution images than subgroup one does. In this case, we're using special techniques like adaptive optics or speckle imaging to try to get rid of atmospheric turbulence and get an even crisper view of the field. This allows us to detect nearby stellar companions that might be less than an arc second away from the star and to estimate better properties for the planet. Because if you have another star in the field, that will dilute the depth of the planetary transit and cause you to think that the planet is smaller than it actually is. If you have more questions about this, you should ask Elise Sperlin about her wonderful paper compiling all of the results of follow-up observations of Kepler targets over the years and David Sciarni about their work working on figuring out how the presence of these companions affects your ability to measure the planet properties. Johanna Tusky also has a great paper on figuring out how the presence of these companions might impact your ability to measure features in a planet occurrence distribution like the planet radius gap. With subgroup three, we can also try to assess whether these candidate stellar companions are physically bound to the target star or merely chance alignments. And that allows us to look into theoretical investigations of how planetary systems form in binary star systems. You might think this is an esoteric topic, but remember, not all stars are single, and there actually are a significant fraction of stars that are born with siblings, so we can't just ignore them. We need to look at how planets form and evolve in those systems as well. As I mentioned before, you can use a variety of techniques for this, like adaptive optics imaging, speckle imaging, and lucky imaging. Here's an example of what these data look like. This is an AO image of the system TOI 139. Here you see a single star, which provides stronger evidence for a transiting planet. Here's another system. Here you see two stars, so you might be suspect, you might think that, oh, this means it's not real. But in this case, this actually is a confirmed planet. It just tells us that we need to adjust the planet radius estimate to account for the light of the nearby star. In subgroup five, we have space-based photometry, which is when you look at the star and get high cadence observations of the brightness. This allows you to get another handle on planet properties, determine better ephemerities, and measure transit timing variations. You could also expand to space-based spectroscopy and measure planetary atmospheres. And I did intentionally talk about subgroup five before subgroup four, because subgroup four is the one that's closely connected to this conference. Subgroup four is precise radio velocity spectroscopy, where you measure the brightness of the target star, you look at the Doppler shift, and then you figure out what the mass of the planet might be and try to estimate what the planet density might be. Once we have the density, we can try to figure out planetary composition. In our solar system, we can divide things into two categories. We could say we have small, mostly terrestrial objects close to the sun, and large gas and ice rich giant planets far from the sun. And just to make sure those two groups don't mix, we have a nice asteroid belt down the middle. Other systems don't really look like this. Uh, there are some cases where the planets seem to be sorted into different groups, 
But we also see systems where the planets are jumbled together, where you have terrestrial planets near gaseous planets near terrestrial planets. So if we only look at our solar system, we get a somewhat naive view of what planetary systems might be. In our solar system, we also have a very big gap in size between the sizes of the inner small planets and the outer gas and ice rich planets. If we look at this figure from Andrew Howard's 2013 paper, what you see is the frequency of planets as a function of planet size. You can see that small planets are more common and larger planets are less common. You can also see that there are lots of planets that have radii in between that of the planets in our own solar system. So before we had mass observations of these planets, it was a big question as to what these planets were actually made out of. Did they look more like the rocky planets of the solar system? Or did they look like the gaseous planets of the outer solar system? Might they even look like the large moons in the outer solar system, where there's a significant amount of water and ice in the planet's composition? Now that we have these follow-up radio velocity observations, we're able to see that we have trends where it looks like the smaller objects are more Earth-like and the larger objects are more Neptune-like. If we have an observation of a planet and we know the planet radius from, radio, from transit observations and the planet mass from radio velocity or transit timing observations, we can construct a generic model of an exoplanet. We could have, say, a gas layer on the outside, an ice and ocean layer, a mantle, and a core, and we can adjust the thicknesses of these layers to try to model what we see. As we're coming up with this model, we'll find that the mass of our model planet is primarily driven by the amount of high density materials. So if you add a bigger core or a bigger mantle, you'll be adding dense material, you'll be really driving up the mass of the planet. If you wanna make the planet bigger, the way you would do that would be to increase the amount of low density materials. So you can try to come up with a model to explain the mass and the radius, but looking at this figure, you can see that you have at least four different layers and you have two numbers. You have a mass and a radius. So this problem is under constraint. You could try to fold in additional information. Maybe you want to use the composition of the star and infer what the composition of the protoplanetary disk might be. And then you could use educated guesses based on the compositions of planets in our own solar system. If you do that, you'll end up with something like this figure from Carolyn Dorn. Where here, you're seeing the planet radius versus planet mass. And all of these black points with errors and different colors representing the equilibrium temperature of the planet show exoplanets for which we have precise measurements of both the mass and the radius. And the colored lines here indicate different models for the comp types of planet compositions. These include models that range from pure iron, which is somewhat unphysical, to models that are more similar to the Earth, like this yellow line. You could pick a different set of models. For instance, maybe you could use Leslie Rogers models or Li Zeng's models. Whichever models that you choose, what you'll notice is that these smaller objects seem to have compositions more similar to that of the Earth, while the larger objects require a larger amount of volatiles, meaning things like water, hydrogen, or helium. So you could construct this model for what the compositions of other exoplanets are, in which the planet mass tells you something about the composition. This looks like it's starting to pull together, but I think it's really important to remember that we're looking at an extremely biased subsample of planets. For planets with which we have precise masses and precise radii, we're looking extremely close to the star. So these planets might have had childhoods that look like this. To really drive this point home, here is a figure from the Exoplanet Science Strategy Report showing the population of planets known at roughly today, 2018. And on the left, you see planet mass versus period. On the right, planet radius versus period. I want you to focus on these red symbols here, which show you the planets of the solar system. In both panels, there's a big gap between where the solar system planets are and where the exoplanets are. That means that we can't really use the mass radius diagram of the close-in planets to say that we know what's going on out at planet periods, such like the Earth and Venus. We need to continue to push out to longer orbital periods and measure the masses of those planets in order to build a fuller picture of exoplanet properties. In the near future, the WFIRST telescope, which has been renamed the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, will launch and conduct a variety of observations to improve our knowledge of planetary systems. Here I'm showing how the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope will use microlensing to probe a population of much cooler planets than the population of planets found by Kepler. You can read more about this in the virtual version of the talk online. But just look at this blue curve here and notice that the Earth and Venus are inside this curve. So with W first, we'll be able to determine the frequency of planets more similar to the Earth. 
and continue building on the results from Kepler. In the last 14 seconds, I'm going to briefly say that we can use transit observations to study system orientations. When a planet crosses in front of the star, it will be blocking the part of the star that's moving towards us or away from us based on the rotation of the star and how that compares to the planet's path across the star. If we take radio velocity observations during transit, we can see whether we're losing primarily blue shifted light or red shifted light from the star during the observation. I'm explaining this quickly now, but you can see the online version of the talk for more details. The short version is that by using this technique, which is known as the Rossin and McLaughlin effect, you can measure the orientation of the planet's orbit around the star, which is important because it allows you to look at models of planet formation. To summarize, we covered four topics today, transiting planets, follow-up observations, planet compositions, and system orientations. We learned that transiting planets are the ones that cross their star. We find them by monitoring decreases in brightness. And that follow-up data can be used to figure out which systems are real and which ones are false positives. We reviewed five different ways that the test follow-up observing program follows up these systems. And then we briefly discussed planet composition and learned that while we measure a mass and a radius, we can use other information to try to infer what the full planet composition might be. We can then use transmission and emission spectroscopy to try to figure out what the planet's atmosphere is and further constrain our model of the planet. Finally, at the very end, we briefly touched on the idea of using the Rossin and McLaughlin effect to study system orientations. We know that some planets are nice and flat and coplanar, like the ones in our, our own solar system, while others have very different orbits. If you want more information, I encourage you to check out the online talk and look at all of these resources. And in particular, I want to call out slides from previous Sagan Summer Workshops. They're a really wonderful resource. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to take your questions. All right. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Courtney. We have a few minutes for some questions. And um, so one that has showed up a couple of times in the Q&A that I'm going to try and summarize here. Can you um, describe a little bit what the, the different um, vetting requirements are and how they've evolved uh, over the Kepler mission and into the test mission uh, to go from a initial transit detection to something that we're more confident in? What are the requirements there to, to, to say we think this is probably a planet and it's worthy of additional follow-up and whatnot? Great. So in the Kepler era, the gold standard was a mass measurement. You wanted to see the planet transit, and then you wanted to do radio velocity observations where you could see a clear signal at that same period, and you noticed that the phase, the radio velocity signal matched the transit observation. So it was transiting when you would expect it to be based on the radio velocity analysis. If you can't do that, um, then what people typically do is they first look in detail at the photometry from the space based observations, and they check to see whether the photo center, which is the center of light on the pixel, is moving in a way that seems correct or incorrect based on the observation. If the star in question is the target star and it's being blocked by the planet, then you would expect to have less flux from that star relative to other things. But if the signal is actually on a different target, then the photo center might be moving during transit in a way that signifies it's a false positive. If it passes that technique and the odd events look like the even events and you don't notice any variations that seem suspect that might indicate that you're actually looking at an eclipsing binary system, then you would want to get additional observations, typically starting with the ground-based scene limited photometry to see if there are any other systems nearby that eclipse, and then moving up to adaptive optics or spectral observation, and then doing radio velocities to see if you see a stellar binary. When you're trying to figure out whether you're actually seeing a stellar binary system or a transiting planet. And it's, it's a lot of work. It's typically probably dozens of hours that go into determining whether something is real or not, even before you start getting precision radio velocities. Great. Um, another question that we have, and, and I've seen questions along this, this line over the last few days, so I think it's a popular topic, is um, can you talk a little bit about uh, exomoons and how we might uh, be discovering them with transits and, and what, the, what the current state of the field is and, and, and does that, you know, the fact that we haven't really been finding these things tell us about uh, planet system formation or stability of, of these orbits and things like that? On the Earth, our moon is a really important feature of our planet, and often when people think about habitability, they think about the fact that the presence of the moon is constraining the obliquity variations of the Earth. In the outer solar system, we have many, many moons, and dozens of moons for the giant planets, but often they're really teeny. Um, some of them seem to have been formed in situ, where others seem to be captured. 
And if you think about it, trying to detect one of those moons means that you're trying to detect the transit of a really small object across the disk of the star. Another way to do it might be that the, the presence of the moon is causing the planet to have a slightly different position on the star than you would expect. So you would see transit timing variations that were due to the orbit of the moon and the planet around each other. Um, so when people try to look for moons and transit data, what they do is they try to model the planetary transit using a moon-free model and look for any deviations. So those could be deviations in the timing of the transit or in the shape of the transit profile. And if you had a moon, perhaps that moon would be in a slightly different position in its transit. So you would see that that little dip is moving in a way that might make sense if you were to do a three-body model that included the moon, the planet, and the star. This is extremely time intensive. And often, like when you do these things, you find that you could come up with a moon-free explanation for what you're seeing in the data. Uh, maybe there's a star spot. Maybe there is another planet causing these kinds of timing variations. It's really tricky. Um, and I think it will be eventually detected. We have some tentative evidence for possible exomoons, especially if you stack observations of multiple planets together and you look for ensemble signals of possible moons, but it's going to be really tricky. Um, personally, I would guess, given that we have so many moons in our solar system, that exomoons definitely exist, but they'll be tricky to detect. Okay, um, and then maybe you, you kind of touched on this, but I want to re-emphasize it or give you a chance to re-emphasize it because I think it's really important. Um, mm -hmm. With the the short stare duration that is plant that the main test mission has, can you can you talk about how um, ground based follow up is is being used and is is important to to go after things that might be at the at the duration of that stare duration, and so may only have one transit or something like that. Right. Um, I don't think I said it. Mm -hmm. I don't think I said it explicitly in this version of the talk, but TESS looks at most targets for only 27 days, which is really, really short. And conventionally in transit surveys, you want to see multiple transits. So if you have a rule that you want to see two or three transits, you're restricting the orbital periods to about 10 days for the sensitivity of TESS. At the ecliptic poles, though, TESS's observations overlap. So you can actually get about a year worth of data. So near the poles, you can find longer period planets more easily. TESS also looks at some fields that were observed by K2 or by the Kepler mission. So you can combine observations that are several months or even years apart. If you don't have that though, if you just have 27 days worth of data, you will have a transit observation. And if you know the properties of the host star, if you know the mass and the radius and the stellar density, you can use equations that you can read about in the, the links that are provided at the end of the talk and in the paper by Seeger and Mel Internasis from 2003. Um, and then you can try to figure out what the orbital period of the planet might be to, to explain the observed transit duration. You would then really want to get radio velocity observations and see if you see any signal in the radio velocities that has an orbital period similar to what you see in the test data. You might also want to use a facility like PEOPS or the old MOST satellite to look at the star and just check to see if you see any decreases in brightness. For the TRAPPIST-1 system, they initially found transits of what they thought were two, transiting planets on the ground, and then they looked with Spitzer and found that that system actually has many more planets. So just by staring at a star that you suspect to have planets, you can sometimes see the transit of that long period planet or see more transits of other planets. We actually just had an HST program accepted to look at the transit of a 542 day orbital period Jupiter planet, and that'll be coming up in May 2021. 